Hello, and welcome to Let's Talk About It. This is your host, Taylor, and I hope that you all are taking care of yourselves. I know the last few weeks, there's just been a lot of things going on, so I hope you're doing everything you can to nourish yourself, nourish your mind, nourish your body, nourish your soul, all of the nourishing. Uh, Today's episode is going to be different. Uh, We have a new guest joining on the show who I'm actually surprised has never came on the show. Um, This guest is very, very dear to my heart. We're going to be talking about sex, but (laughs) sex during pregnancy and sex uh, post-pregnancy or post-birth. And yeah, today's guest is my very, very dear friend since I was five years old, uh, four or five, I think five, six, somewhere around there. But like basically my first, yeah, five or six when I first moved to Seattle from New Jersey. Um, so we have my best friend Casey joining us. So welcome to the show. (laughs) Thanks. Excited to be here. Yeah, you um for those that are just listening on audio, you are rocking in your rocking chair right now with your baby girl feeding. Yeah. Got to so do what is- you got to do whenever you can. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um so I would love like maybe if you can share a little bit like for folks to just kind of understand our friendship a little bit and just kind of like how we met and <laughs> your face. <laughs> Like, where do I even start? I don't know. <laughs> I was yeah. six. I think you were like, you had to have been like four then because of our age difference. I would have been in first grade. So I don't know. Really? I was in first grade. I was born in 93. Yeah. Because yeah. I did kindergarten in uh, Bridgeton, New Jersey. And then when I moved to Seattle, I started at Co and did, that's where we met at Co. Oh, then I must have been eight. Yeah, I just always backtrack to like, as soon as I was in elementary school, Taylor was there. We were together through the whole thing. Um, yeah, so very little, very young, and you're two years younger than me, um, but that did not matter. I feel like we, from my recollection, just like didn't even become like best friends. We just became like sisters mm-hmm. instantly because um, we definitely would fight like sisters, but love yeah. each other like sisters and... Yeah. So, and then Definitely. I just continued. and you moved away, of course. Um, mm-hmm. Well, I moved, you know, out of that school first, but then you officially moved to a different state and mm-hmm. just remained pen pals and up yeah. until you moved back. Yeah. That's just continued. I feel so like it's very special. Yeah. I feel like there's honestly so many different, like we could talk about like long distance friendship. Like we were basically long distance friends for like 10 years, basically. Yeah. A good, like half of our relationship, I think has been long distance. So, yeah. and because I moved, um, you know, for two years to Germany, I like forget about that, but yeah, I was gone too for a couple of years. So. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It definitely from when we first met, like you said, fought like sisters were just, you know, we loved each other and we hated each other. (laughs) But I always looked up to you. And I remember actually the other day in the car, I was listening to like old 2000s, like hip hop and Ashanti came on. And I remember I was like, oh my God, like Casey was the first person to introduce me to Ashanti. And I just remember like thinking it was like so cool. And I just like looked up to her. It was just like, she's introducing me to like all these cool things. (laughs) Yeah, we would dance, we would sing, and just all all the fun. So, yeah. yeah. We've seen each other through many stages of life. <laughs> all the stages thus far, besides, you know, babies. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, but now yeah. here we are. You just gave birth um, and are starting a whole new chapter of your life. And I'm really, like, appreciative and, you know, excited that, like, you want to talk about all this on here um, and kind of share a little bit of your experience. Um, you know, I think I would love for you to give people a little bit of background into, like, starting your family. Um, like, from finding a husband or <laughs> like, that far back? I don't know. I wanted one. Finding a husband. <laughs> Um, we well, too, and I feel like this is also just important. Like, we are so different in so many ways, <laughs> but yeah. I have always appreciated that, like, even in our differences, and even where, like, maybe I seem like I'm being a little wild and shit, that, like, 
you've never been judgmental about it. Like you've always been supportive of it. And I feel like hopefully you feel the same way of me towards your life and and decisions and and experiences. Like definitely being, taking very different paths sometimes in some uh, stages of our lives, but still supporting each other through it. It feels like we have no choice at this point. Like you (laughs) we're stuck with each other for life. Yeah, absolutely. I think both of us have said that many times. <laughs> like she's not, you know, it's not even a question. It has to be. So, um, yeah, no, I am a Gemini. So I feel like half of me is like wild and crazy and just, yes. you know, wants to live <clears throat> one type of lifestyle. And then the other half of me very strongly is like, I just want a farm with a wraparound porch and my husband to bring me flowers. And so I don't feel like I've ever really like lived both at the same time, but I feel like I've definitely bounced back and forth, you Mm -hmm. know, between um, my two different sides. So Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah. Um, Well, so I've always wanted to be a mom my entire life. Like I've always really looked forward to being pregnant. I've always really looked forward to having a baby. I've always known that I wanted to give birth um, naturally or without medication um, because all birth is natural, but I wanted Mm -hmm. to do it unmedicated. And I always thought maybe I would do it at home. Um, that as the time came on your wrap <laughs> right on that front porch, <laughs> hanging <laughs> on the stairs with the cows. <laughs> um, so when the time came, um, oh, well, first, I guess to answer your question, I just, I've always looked forward to it. And so similar mm-hmm. to when I met Justin and started dating him, um, we got married really quickly, like a year after we started dating. Mm-hmm. Um, cause I have, had other relationships that really taught me what I was really looking for. Uh, so when I found it, I knew it. And um, yeah, so we got married pretty quickly a year after we started dating. And then um, we were supposed to have our wedding a, a year after that, because we got married in Germany at a courthouse. So no one was there. Mm-hmm. Um, but because of COVID that got postponed and I just didn't want to postpone anything else. I really have a habit of wanting to do something and then having very little patience and doing it like immediately. Uh, Even if it's maybe not the best timing, I'm like, nope, I want to now we're going to do it. So uh, that's kind of what happened when we decided to have um, our baby and yeah, four months of trying. That was interesting because you're taught your whole life that like, don't slip Mm -hmm. and fall or you'll get pregnant, like can happen so easily. And for some people it definitely can. Um, but it's very interesting to go from like thinking it could be so easy and trying not to your whole life. And then, Mm -hmm. um, a month goes by, two months goes by and every month you're just like, "Uh Oh, why is this not as easy as I thought? Um, so that's like emotional, but four months really is not very long at all. Um, compared to a lot of people. So we, yeah. Got yeah. pregnant and well and how does that I mean how do you find like we we always talk so much about sex all the time um there's also I am like a happy like just to be friends <laughs> with you <laughs> not like I've always had someone that we could just like, talk about sex yeah. with um I don't know Favorite if you remember subject. this but one of my memories of us is like making out with our hands and like trying to give ourselves like <laughs> hickeys on our arms <laughs> do you remember I doing believe it uh you know not specifically but I know that like when I was younger I was just making out with mirrors making out with the back of your hand like you know just getting ready for the real deal yeah yeah some serious prep work there um (laughs) but you know I'm wondering how like that changed if you can talk on this a little bit of how trying to get pregnant like changes your sex life like how that impacted it for you yeah um because now it's like sex has like a goal yeah definitely and um there's different things that you hear you know we I was doing ovulation strips and tracking my cycle and definitely wasn't the same as like oh I just feel like having sex right now so we're gonna you know organically start having sex it was like every day I like made it a goal like for two of the months we had sex every single day (laughs) like 
whether we really felt like it or not, which I really always kind of feel like it, but <laughs> um, it was definitely more, you know, my husband is not on that same uh, spectrum as me when it comes to libido. So for him, I think it definitely was like, okay, she wants me to have sex every day. Like I can do this. <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, I think for him, it probably felt, you know, more like a to-do list. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas I was like, sweet, we're going to have sex every single day. Um, but also, yeah, something that like had a goal behind it, not just Mm -hmm. enjoying having sex. So, um, Mm -hmm. yeah, it was definitely different. And our, um, difference in libidos, you know, has played into that in the past. I, um, when we first started dating, He told me, you know, like right away um, that like I really enjoyed having sex a lot more than Mm -hmm. what just naturally came to him. Yeah. Um, And so that was something that we've like worked through throughout our entire relationship. Um, I feel personally like he's done a great job of meeting (laughs) me where I need to be met. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And then. And then just different seasons. So when we moved home from Germany, I definitely felt some depression and just exhaustion Mm -hmm. all the time. So the amount that we had sex went down, you know, pretty significantly from what we were. Uh, And then, and then, you know, for those couple of months when we were trying to get pregnant, like every day, um, and then sex during pregnancy was... um, not we'll, we'll get what I expected. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, at first I think it's like fantastic that he was able to actually communicate that as well. Like I think a lot of men have some insecurities around that and like would not, would, would maybe just kind of push it down and like try and kind of perform right and put on a face about it. Uh, but being able to actually communicate that, like, you know, that, that the, that his libido is going to be lower than yours is like, key. And I I think like people don't realize how common that is to have like mismatched libidos. Like it's actually incredibly rare and kind of unrealistic to expect that you and your partner are going to have the same like libido at all times that like you're both going to be on the same page no matter what. Like that's just not how it works. Yeah. And I think especially um, when it comes to like male female relationships, we're really told throughout our whole lives Mm -hmm. that like men, you know, really want it all the time. And it's almost like expected of women to like, please your man. And, you know, so when as an adult, you know, with a high libido, Mm -hmm. I have several times found it, you know, I don't know, off putting or just unexpected that like, Mm -hmm. I'm the one who wants to have more sex than this Mm -hmm. guy. Like, shouldn't he always want me? Shouldn't I be turning him down? And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, with multiple partners, like you said, it's way more common than Mm -hmm. people realize. And so it can be when Justin brought it up to me, it's like, I want you to know, like, I find you extremely attractive. I really enjoy having sex with you. I want to have sex with you. And I just don't want you to feel any differently if I'm not meeting, you know, where you're Mm -hmm. at all the time. Yeah. That a lack of desire to engage and have intercourse with your partner is not necessarily a, I don't desire you or I yeah. don't enjoy you or I am not attracted to you. It's not one doesn't equal the other. Definitely. Yeah. All right, we're going to take a short break right here. I want to talk sex toys for a minute from, of course, my favorite, Balesa Boutique. Their sex toy store is bboutique.co and they are number 1 rated sex toy store on Google. The number 1. They have over 25,000 reviews and like they're all over Instagram. Like you definitely know who Balesa Boutique is at this point. And if not, then you probably have seen them on Cardi B's profile because she loves the Balesa vibrators and she has gifted them to all of the guests at her birthday party. And she posts them. I've seen them on her page several times. So, uh, but the toy that I want to share with y'all is the uh, Balesa's discreet line, because the number one thing that people talk about um, that they ask Balesa Boutique about about is discretion. And I feel like I also get that question anytime I talk about toys. And so they have this new discreet line that is just taken Instagram by storm. They come in these super cute clamshell charging cases. Um, So they look like little compact makeup cases (laughs) and you can literally like 
throw them in your purse. You can, they charge like right on the outside of the case. So it can even be charging and still kind of be um, hidden in a way, but Oh, they have uh, the discrete air and the discrete vibe. Both um, are clitoral stimulator vibrators, um, and all of them are made from premium body safe materials and are waterproof. I own them and I love them, and I'm super excited to share them with y'all because you can get 15% off of all sex toys at Be Boutique and free U.S. shipping with the code Taylor15. That's B B O U. T-I-Q-U-E dot C-O and get 15% off and free U.S. shipping with the code Taylor15. And I mean, own the same vibrator as Cardi B. Like, what are you, what are you doing? That's amazing. All right. We can now get back to the show. Well, I guess I'm wondering here if we get a little bit into sex during pregnancy. Um, not sure if there's anything else you want to share or had other thoughts around, you know, sex pre-pregnancy or on having mismatched libido. Um, you actually did say, you know, that you feel like you guys have been able to talk through that and work through that. Is there anything that you think you could share there maybe for folks who are struggling with having mismatched libido in terms of things Um, you guys tried or how you communicated about it? Yeah, something that really pops into my mind is just like affection in general. And you can have, you can be sexually affectionate without having sexual intercourse, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, things that I've told him that kind of helped me with that is, you know, just more like random kisses or random touching or, you know, like he'll just come up behind me and kiss my neck like unexpectedly. And so, those kinds of things make me feel like just the more like physical touch. Mm -hmm. It's definitely like one of my love languages is I need that. And so, um, just, you know, that's something where it's like, Oh, not so much of a performance thing. It's just like, Mm -hmm. Oh, I could do this more, you know, and it's kind of a step in between. So you can still have Mm -hmm. that affection and that helps. Um, and then, yeah, I think both partners being open to communication is always important, right? Especially on sensitive subjects. So, Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I don't always say it the way I should, you know, and I'm like, (laughs) why don't you ever want to have sex with me? Or Mm -hmm. (laughs) like, and really it's been like two days and he's (laughs) like, why would you say that? (laughs) You know, that's not true. (laughs) We had sex one day ago or whatever. And I'm like, but you didn't try, like I initiated it or, you know, just like insecurities, um, popping Mm -hmm. up and, and then we talk about it and I'm like, okay, fine. Like, I guess, you know, Mm -hmm. that's a little unrealistic, but you know, my mind, um, but yeah. Love your mind. (laughs) Yeah. I'm just like, why? Um, and then he obviously makes me realize like, actually, um, we just did and, Mm -hmm. but okay. Like I hear you. And, um, actually what I shared with you the other day, I think might be something, it seems awkward and like unorganic, but I told him, um, with the initiating part of it, because for him, I could probably initiate every day and he would, Mm -hmm. and he would go with it and be fine. But I do don't like, I don't want to always be the one initiating. So it seems, you know, like, Oh, I wish it wasn't this way, but really if you want things to work, like I recommended, like set an alarm on your phone, you know, how, how often would you want to have sex on a weekly basis? You know, what seems like Mm -hmm. a good amount for you? And then whatever that amount is like, set an alarm on your phone two, three days a week, whatever it is. I don't need to know that the alarm is set on your phone or that it's marked on a calendar somewhere, wherever, you know. You're going to like hear (laughs) Pony go off on his phone and know that he's about to come climbing on top. (laughs) Exactly. I'm going to start to notice that like every Monday and Wednesday, you know, um, but you know, whatever he's got to do. And then, Mm -hmm. uh, that's just, you know, meeting each other halfway and Mm -hmm. trying to make, make it work. So always working on Mm -hmm. keeping your partner satisfied, both of each other, you know, both. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like encouraging him to schedule sex when he would actually want to do it. Um, you know, and, and kind of, having a little bit of that accountability for initiation of like, you know, yeah, I do want to have sex on, on in this kind of a frequency, you know, making sure that 
I'm going to actually initiate that when I want it instead of expecting that I know Casey will want to anyway and will probably do it tonight anyway. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, one thing I do always like love about you is you are just like so honest with shit, even if it's like hella, hella wild and like just absurd. Sometimes you're just like, I don't care. Yeah. That's what it is. That's where I'm at. (laughs) I know it's crazy. This is how I feel. So, (laughs) yeah. But I mean, I think like the, the, I think the, the, that it's so relatable, like the, that frustration, right. Of just like, why will you just have sex with me? Like, why, why, why don't you want to have sex with me? Even though like maybe you just had sex like two days ago. Um, you know, I'm wondering if, if like you've unpacked that or if you've talked about that with him of like what comes up with that. Cause I think a lot of people, probably struggle with that and and feel like that, especially like in cishet relationships of, you know, the woman feeling that way of like, wait, like I should be sought after right now. You know, I should be being pursued and like that bringing up some stuff of like frustration of, why won't you just have sex with me? Yeah. Um, Well, for me, it definitely, and like this could be a whole nother thing that I think you've wanted to talk about in the past with me. Um, which like you and I have talked about on a personal level. Mm-hmm. Um, but besides just like growing up and seeing in, you know, the media that the woman should be sought after and, and all of that we talked about, um, my personal past experiences um, with cheating, you know, in a monogamous relationship, like we, mm-hmm. you know, it was established, it was a monogamous relationship and I had been cheated on. I had been lied to. Um, I also have cheated in the past and that was a very unhealthy relationship. Um, our sexual relationship was not healthy. However, that is not the reason why either one of us cheated, yeah. um, but it plays a role into it. And so I think having unhealthy relationships in the past and having those experiences on both ends kind of leads to my own personal anxiety of Mm -hmm. everything needs to be good in a relationship and like having expectations or, you know, something will happen that we don't want to happen. Oh, if my Mm -hmm. sexual needs aren't being met, maybe I will, you know, find desire for someone else and like I never want to go down that path again or vice versa oh if he's not wanting it from me or not getting it from me what if he you know looks somewhere else for those types of things Mm -hmm. um and in reality a lot of what my relationship with Justin has taught me is just about being in a healthy relationship and that if you have open communication and mostly just respect for each other um that if that's what you've decided, if that's the type of relationship you've decided to be in, Mm -hmm. you'll work through those things rather than seeking them elsewhere and like betraying Mm -hmm. your partner. So, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think like from our conversations, you know, like there is a difference between like finding someone else attractive and then like hitting them up and planning to get together so that you can then like cheat on your partner. Right. Like I think both of you, at least from my understanding, like know that you're gonna find other people attractive um for sure uh, we're not even each other's types like (laughs) physically what we both are mostly attracted to it's it's not usually each other so yeah of course we're gonna find others attractive and um Mm -hmm. yeah but yeah Yeah. for our specific relationship it's chosen to be monogamous and Mm -hmm. um so yeah so I think those are just some fears just with any type of relationship like anxiety Mm -hmm. can come up especially um, from past trauma. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's so, so important to unpack and I know you work to unpack that. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, we can transition here and talk a little bit about sex during pregnancy for you. If you want to share a bit of maybe kind of what you thought that would look like initially, what maybe you imagined it would look like. Yeah. So, Um, of course, like when preparing to become pregnant or even during pregnancy, you hear so many stories from so many different people and their Mm -hmm. experiences. And I'm, you know, even joining an online group of all these women expecting to be pregnant or expecting to give birth at the same time as me. 
and it's a group of like 4,000 women <clears throat> and they're mm-hmm. all posting. And then there's women who I know personally in my life who share their experiences. And a lot of what I heard was increased libido. Oh, your hormones are changing and you just want to have sex all the time. I also read that a lot of women have more lubrication during pregnancy and, um, that would just was not my experience at all. I, Mm -hmm. between, you know, having morning sickness, being exhausted. And then personally, I really dried out. It was not very lubricated internally for me. Mm -hmm. And so sex became very uncomfortable. Um, I seldom wanted to initiate. And as I already told you, like my partner is not a big initiator. Mm -hmm. So it just became really infrequent. And then on the A huge fear during the first trimester is um, possible miscarriage. I'm so scared. Oh, no. What if this causes a miscarriage? And even though everything says that there's no, like, studies or science that says that it would contribute and it should be perfectly safe and fine, I just knew that if we did have sex and then afterwards I did miscarry, I would always relate it to that. And that's not how I wanted to, it's not what I wanted to associate with my sex life because I knew that would impact it in the future. So we really didn't have any kind of intercourse for the first trimester. And then we did have intercourse and like penetrative because there's all sorts of sex, right? So when I'm talking about sex, I'm really just talking about penis and vagina. So um, you're my best friend because you know that, you know that. (laughs) Penis and vagina here. So uh, we did and I did, you know, we both like orgasmed and I remember thinking like, oh, it's really wet. And um, that scared me because I thought he's going to get off of me and I'm going to see blood. And I was so scared that it would be blood. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, got off and it wasn't, it was just wet. And I just immediately just burst into tears and like all the hormones and anxiety and I just started you know sobbing and he just like laid down and helped me he's like are you okay what's going on um you know I told him my thoughts and feelings around Mm -hmm. that and so then let's fast forward like a month or something because I really think we only had sex maybe five yeah five times maybe in Mm -hmm. the whole 10 months of pregnancy um so then we you know, I can't remember exactly each individual time, but one thing that really stuck out for me was um, we did have sex one time and sure enough, I was bleeding. He came out and there was a bunch of blood and he told me, we were like going to switch positions and he looked down and saw blood and was like, um, you know, Casey, you're bleeding. And that was really traumatic and scary for both of us. Yeah. Um, it scared the heck out of him because that, you know, if he's already not as, Mm-hmm. wanting to have sex as me and then that happens he's like forget it I can wait like, we don't need to do it um and so that was really scary and apparently it's very very common I called my midwife um she said it's happens very regularly because there's increased blood flow to all of the tissues down there during pregnancy and so just membranes can like rupture easier if they're mm-hmm. especially with some friction um, and as I mentioned like I didn't have as much natural lubrication and so even using uh, additional lube the inside especially up high you know is still a bit drier and so that friction okay Justin getting up high all right <laughs> <laughs> it was real deep. No, so, <laughs> um, yeah. okay, we are keeping this like very, like we have maintained our composure. We have not gotten to where like we usually get in our personal conversation. So probably. definitely uh, trying to respect Justin. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, he also was not as much of a sharer as I am. So, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, yeah, and he totally is fine with me sharing today. But yeah, that was also yeah. weird for me, like in our friendship, because usually I feel like we talk so openly about that. But like when you guys did start dating, and I was like, I had all these questions, and I was like, Yeah, like how are things going for you? And you were like uh, more reserved in that. I was like, Why are you not? I don't understand. Like, give me the fuck. details. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, girl, the fuck? Let's talk about this shit. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um. Yeah, so it was scary. And so we really didn't very much. um, But there was a lot of internal pressure also in my brain because there's the things that we already talked about. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, I'm not having sex with my husband. 
I hope that's okay. I hope he's still satisfied in our relationship. I hope he's not going to look for that piece elsewhere. Um, And then also thinking her life is about to change. I don't know what my vagina is going to be like after I shove a human out of it. Mm -hmm. I don't know when we're going to have time to have sex, what it's going to feel like, any of those things. So part of me also felt like now's the time. We need to be having a lot of sex now before we don't have any more sex again for 19 years or Mm -hmm. whatever. (laughs) So um, just feeling that extra pressure and then Mm -hmm. trying to navigate that between reality. yeah. was a challenge. So definitely wasn't enjoyable to an extent. I mean, I love being intimate with him always. So that part was enjoyable, but I just cried. I think there was maybe one time that I didn't cry during mm-hmm. sex, uh, during pregnancy. So most of the time I either, you know, was crying or I bled and it just wasn't the type of sex that you really want to have and enjoy. So yeah. that was the challenge for me personally. I really mm-hmm. think that it didn't, probably affect Justin very much besides him feeling bad that it was affecting me. Mm -hmm. Um, But for him personally, I think he was fine with all of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think what's sticking out for me even like, cause I could definitely tell. And I remember like you kind of putting some of this pressure on yourself and of like feeling that internal pressure of like, well, like we need, like, I need to have sex. We need to have sex now. And you know, that, that there is this assumption that we have about relationships that like, if we're not having sex, we're not happy. If we're not having sex with each other, then it's not a healthy relationship. Then it's, and then it's not a good relationship. And I mean, the truth is, is that that's going to ebb and flow throughout the relationship, right? Like, there might be times where someone is sick, right? Or someone is having a low libido or someone's dealing with depression or you get pregnant, right? Like there are going to be these things that come up in your life to where it's going to impact and and change and transition what your sex life looks like. And that doesn't inherently mean that your relationship is doomed because you aren't, you know, or even that Jack it's going in a bad direction. Other. Like you could still have, you could be having one of the best times in your relationship mm-hmm. and, not be having the most sex or even the most pleasurable yeah. sex that you've ever had with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Totally. So definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Sex. Some and there, you know, when we're talking about, um, like I was specifically talking about like penetrative sex, mm-hmm. but even oral sex, right? So that's one of the things that you recommended to me. Oh, well, can you guys still do that or other things? Mm-hmm. Right. And, um, when you are nauseous, <laughs> you do not want to be deep throat in somebody like <laughs> Girl, you don't Hello. have a deep throat. It's all in the tip. <laughs> I guess so, that's true. But you can go you know, extra. <laughs> just like the sucking motion and you're like yeah. drooling all over and it's just you know, when you're not feeling very sexy and you're feeling mm-hmm. nauseous that's not really something (laughs) like for me personally that uh, was appealing. And then for me feeling self-conscious. So everything down there, I mentioned like extra blood flow. I was Mm -hmm. so swollen, like Mm -hmm. towards the end or like a month or something before I was going to get birth. I looked down there with a mirror because you (laughs) stop seeing your vagina at a certain point. Your belly is definitely in the way. Um, I looked down there with a mirror and I was like, whoa, (laughs) Justin, have you seen this? Come look at my vagina. <laughs> like, this is crazy. Um, it was just super, super swollen. It was like mm-hmm. really fat, like everywhere. Um, yeah, just big and puffy. And uh, yeah, it was surprising to see. Um, yeah. yeah. And I was like, you're not ever going to want to have sex with me after you look at this. But like, you've got to see this. <laughs> it looks so <laughs> different. And like hormones, mm. my eyes, I smell like not in an unhealthy, like, oh, yeah. there might be something going on, just strong, like my body odor, even under my arms, you mm. know, my body odor, just in general pheromones, I guess, is yeah. just way stronger um, during pregnancy, post-pregnancy. Mm-hmm. So I'm just like lathering on the DO, but, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, so for him, you know, going down on me even is like, oh, I don't know, yeah, you know, about that. So, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, your body's like going through a ton of changes and 
it's one thing to like experience that yourself, right. Of just like recognizing these changes. It's another thing to then have that pressure on yourself to try to like be sexy and, you know, just continue having sex as normal. And, you know, to then also be sharing your body with your partner when it is going through all these changes. And some of that might be freaking you out a little bit. That's a lot. Yeah. And you're just wondering, what is my body going to look like after this? What is sex going to feel like after this? Mm -hmm. Um, All of that. What's my relationship in general going to be like after this? So, Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Let's talk talk about about what it's like after. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) First of all, I shoved a whole human out of my vagina. (laughs) That was crazy. (laughs) You really did. It's wild. wild. Oh my God. Yeah. That was really wild. Um, yeah. And what's even more wild is how your body heals itself afterwards. I mean, shocked, like just so shocked. Um, I mean, even after I passed a whole human out of there, I, you know, I was having like blood clots for mm-hmm. a week or so afterwards, huge, like the size of lemons. Um, my mom joked that like, oh my gosh, I think her twin just, I fell out of there. That was <laughs> it's huge. And so there's a lot going on mm-hmm. and they send you home with the biggest diapers, like literally yeah. dog pads, like the training pads. They send you <laughs> home with those to go underneath the giant mm-hmm. pads they give you. Um, so there's a lot of healing that needs to take place. And in general, you know, they say that you should wait six weeks before mm-hmm. you have intercourse or start exercising or any of those things. Um, and even a couple of weeks afterwards, I was thinking like six weeks is too soon. I'm not going to have sex again for like six months. Like, <laughs> oh my gosh, I can't imagine, you know, doing anything like that. And you're scared. Like even when I'm like rinsing myself off in the shower, I was scared to like touch it because I'm just so scared that it's going to be painful. I'm going to touch something and it's going to be reliving birth or something um, because giving birth without medication and I'm sure with medication too, it's just can be a very traumatic experience. Mm -hmm. So you're just a little anxious afterwards, or at least I was. Yeah. And, um, a couple weeks afterwards when the swelling had gone down, I mean, (laughs) this was ready. (laughs) My vagina was better than it was during the whole pregnancy. Even a year before that, I was a virgin again. It was like no swelling, so flat. It was just really a miracle. <laughs> like, the body's incredible for it to like bounce back like that. Um, mm. Because like I said, during pregnancy, there's so much extra blood flow and um, circulation and just swelling to the area because of all the pressure that's inside of there. So once that was gone and all the swelling had gone, gone down, um, it was great. I was really pleasantly surprised mm-hmm. um, at what it looked like, what it felt like, everything. And um, so I was still a bit nervous uh, to actually do anything, though, um, sexually. But I did wait the full six weeks. I actually waited, I think, like seven, seven and a half because I very unluckily got my period back like right away I started I stopped I think at like four weeks you're like can I do it now I'm ready I want to do it now I was like Casey I I wanted to get my sugaring I wanted to get a Brazilian yeah and I was like girl let it for having sex (laughs) I was like girl you just pushed a human out of your body now you want to go wax yourself I was like yeah I mean, they even told me at the waxing place, they're like, no, we don't do that until six weeks postpartum. I was like, can I get a note from my doctor? I'm fine. Like, please, you're only going to make the job harder on yourself if you wait. <laughs> I want to come in. Oh, gosh, um, yeah. So I was ready, definitely. And just knowing like to take it really slow, because again, the things that you hear and read Mm -hmm. for postpartum sex, um, I'm exclusively breastfeeding. And so you're told that that can also really dry things out. Um, So, hey, actually, I guess there's a benefit that I'm getting from this because that did not happen for me. Um, They also tell you that the weight's going to fall right off of you. um, And they tell you you're not going to get your period back for like a year or as long as you're breastfeeding. I have not lost a single pound since giving birth. Um, And what does that matter? It does not matter that much. (laughs) 
to give my body. I'm clearly still working through that process. <laughs> Mentally, That's a different okay. episode to unpack. Yes. I've got clothes that fit me that I feel comfortable in. Um, mm-hmm. So it's okay. I'm um, having my wedding dress altered. So I'll still feel good there. Yeah, um, your body just did some amazing things. You're healthy. Your baby girl's healthy. Your body is exactly how it's supposed to be and exactly what it needs to be right now for you. And that's amazing. I need it to bounce back like my vagina. <laughs> Why can't the whole body do something like that? <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, sex afterwards has been actually really pleasantly good. So even though I haven't lost weight, even though I got my period back, um, I actually have a lot more internal lubrication. So we did use like extra lube and we did go very slow um, Mm -hmm. at first, but it's been really pleasantly surprising. Like in a, it's been really good. So um, it's great. I feel like fast forward or rewind three years ago um, to the height of my sexcapades you know, and I'm like, the height of the hotation. (laughs) It's wonderful. Only with my husband, you know, only with Justin, but yeah. (laughs) So it's been great. And I, I wonder, you know, I haven't talked to um, him too much about it besides saying like, Hey, set an alarm on your phone to initiate. Um, And I've told him, you know, I'm really enjoying this again. I really want it all the time again, stuff like that. Um, But I haven't asked him too much about how he feels about that because I'm sure it's probably like equally as surprising on his end to be like, okay, now I need to like get back like, to performing all the more. time. He's probably like, I thought I had a few more months and now she's just ready again. Like what all is the this time. woman? <laughs> yeah. He didn't want to be pregnant like a little bit longer. <laughs> so um, yeah. So now we're just kind of back to that, like the beginning of our relationship where Hmm. Um, I'm really enjoying sex and wanting it all the time and pleasantly surprised at how great it's been. And so then we're just navigating the different libido thing again. So, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. And it, it is makes- strange having a baby next to you though. That's for sure. Yeah. Her making noises and I'm like, is she okay? Throw the binky in there real quick. <laughs> like that definitely adds another element to things, but Yeah. 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 I I mean, can we talk about that for a second? Because like people ask me questions just about like masturbating and like having my cat come in the room and having Lily come in the room. And I'm like, low key, I legit have had Lily crawl up on my chest while I'm masturbating. Do I stop? (laughs) For what? (laughs) For what? (laughs) Yeah. No. Um, same, you know, I've got Alfred and Aubrey and that's yeah. my cat and dog. And Alfred's definitely like just been chilling on the bed. Although he usually is like, I don't know what's going on, but I'm out of here. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta go. Aubrey usually looks concerned. She's like, are you okay? <laughs> Do you need help? Like, what is happening to my mom that's right now? <laughs> yeah. Especially when we're like having sex, she looks real concerned afterwards. <laughs> like, are you okay? Um, But yeah, with a baby, it's just one distracting because you're on 24-7. You need to make sure this human is like, okay, all the time. Um, And so you're just hoping that they're asleep, that they stay asleep. And then if they're not asleep, of course, it crosses my mind like, is this going to impact them in any way? Are they going to remember these things? (laughs) No, I don't remember that young. You know, but just like making impressions Mm -hmm. Even if it's like subconscious on them, I wonder about that. Um, Mm -hmm. But, and then just also, I think it's going to be a whole thing to navigate, like raising a child and talking about sex and what's healthy. And, you know, I don't want her to like grow up thinking, having any fear of sex or thinking it's unhealthy in any way. And, you know, just like really being educational rather Mm -hmm. than taboo, you know, so yeah. um, that'll be something that we probably navigate throughout her whole life or childhood. So Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, and she's always got me to talk to you too. Yeah, definitely. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Um, Well, and I mean, I'm wondering, you know, like right now it's like, I mean, she's still so teeny tiny, still so like, I'm so weird when it comes to babies. Like, yes, she's a human, you know, but like, she's still like, not yet fully like a, you know what I mean? Like a, like a, 
like a, a human, like she is a human, but just like, I mean, I don't she even still know. can't I'm control s- her hands. Or yeah, arms. yeah, like, like she around, can't so. speak yet. You know what I mean? Like it's just like I'm always like when I watch kids grow up, I'm like, oh, like they're like becoming little humans. You know, like they're like little pe- like they're. It's just it blows my freaking mind. Um, you know, but, but when she's like two and a half, three years old, you know, and it's like walking around and like starting to talk, you know, like that definitely will change how y'all are having sex. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I mean, because then they'll have questions, right? So yeah, that's and kind I'm of actually, when that imprinting, you know, starts happening. Because then, like right now, I don't think she really knows the difference, right? Of like, oh, I don't know what they're doing. Like they're on top of each other, okay. But like when she's like three, she's gonna be like, "What? What's that? What are you guys doing? Are mom, mommy and daddy wrestling? Like, yeah. is mommy okay?" <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's, you know, there's a lot that goes into that too, um, that I've been trying to educate myself around, um, Mm -hmm. some different pages and just, um, I mean, I try to just talk to her now and like say everything that I'm doing, even around her body and teaching like body autonomy Mm -hmm. and just prevention of like sexual, abuse or anything that could happen outside of the home that I'm not aware of. Um, just always talking to her when I'm bathing her or changing Mm -hmm. her, like you said, she doesn't even, you know, she's still not fully aware yet. Right. And definitely um, developed, but I don't, is probably the better word to use, but I'm just, I'm just weird when it comes to babies. (laughs) I'm just like, the whole thing just blows my mind and I'm awkward. (laughs) It's crazy. It really is crazy. But I just tell her like, okay, I'm going to clean you now and I'm going to clean your vagina and I have to get in the folds and we want to make sure, you know, there's no poop in your vagina or, mm-hmm. you know, just stuff like that. You know, she has no idea what I'm saying, but yeah. never too young, I think, to start those things. And when she is a little bit older and kind of sleeping on her own or maybe just even six months old, we'll probably move her into her own room at that point. Um, and then sex will be kind of more um, away anyways. We won't have mm-hmm. to necessarily worry about her being there like right next to us while it's happening. So mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, then we'll just have to worry about her walking in on us <laughs> when we're <laughs> doing it. <laughs> Yeah, Which honestly, so. I feel like I can already foresee happening many times throughout her life. <laughs> just need to lock the door when we're doing it. So that way she like has to knock and then she won't ever fully catch us. But as yes. she gets older, she'll know, uh-oh, the door is locked. <laughs> yeah, she'll know it's mommy and daddy time and that's important to have. And seeing you guys prioritize your relationship and prioritizing that quality time together, I think is a good thing. That's something that Justin and I have talked about a lot, even before getting pregnant, is just always putting our relationship first. I think Mm -hmm. a lot of people have the idea, especially mothers, my baby comes first. I love my my baby so much more than anything. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I love her very much. um, But especially going through the birth process, like, I love Justin more than anything, you know, my partner and our relationship. And I think it's super important for her as she grows up to watch that and um, be a part of it and just realize like how important that is. Um, Because I think if our relationship is strong and we're happy and we put ourselves and our relationship Mm -hmm. um, as the first priority, it's just going to make her life happier and easier and um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, be a good example for her. So, yeah. How do you think he will talk about things related to sex and and our bodies with her? He probably won't. <laughs> like, I don't know. He actually said that he doesn't. Um, he doesn't really like lip kissing. He thinks lip kissing is an intimate thing. Uh, this is actually something that just got brought up last night, mm. where. Um, there was a picture sent from him as a little boy kissing his mom. And he's like, oh, that's strange to see now as an adult. And he's like, I don't think I'm ever going to lip kiss her. And I'm like, oh, just like cheek kisses. And he's like, yeah, like we'll just give each other kisses on the cheeks. And I'm like, well, what about mothers and daughters, you know, kissing each other on the lips? How do you feel about that? And, um, and he's like, yeah, I just don't think it's necessary. He's like, I just think like lip kissing is more of an intimate thing. And, will you know 
I mean, he doesn't care. I can kiss my daughter on lips if I want to, but for him, he just doesn't find it to be, he just thinks of it as more of an intimate Hmm. act to do. Um, And honestly, I don't kiss her on the lips anyways, but that's just because I get cold sores and Mm -hmm. I don't want to kill her. So (laughs) like terrified to kiss her on the lips and like give her, you know, HSV. So um, for us, like I probably always will also do the cheek kissing Mm -hmm. but like that's just you know to answer your question that's where he's at with all of those kinds of things so Mm -hmm. I think he'll probably be pretty reserved and oh you know I there's not going to be any like he's not going to shower with her I think he'll probably Mm -hmm. really try to cover himself um and that it would be different and we're definitely talking about um the idea that they're going to be um you know, identify as if we have future kids, like if this is the idea and thinking they're going to identify as a male or female and they're going to be heterosexual, Mm -hmm. um, which of course could definitely end up not being the case. And that Mm -hmm. would be a hundred percent fine, but just going into raising them, having that idea and that being kind of what navigates. Cause I think to him, like if we had a son, I'd probably, I would not, I would be walking around naked. I don't know when I would stop walking around naked. You know, like, whatever, this is my house. I like being naked. You came out of there. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, maybe it's a little bit of a different relationship with, you know, mom, because it is like, uh, literally puts you out of my vagina. <laughs> this body is where you grew and came out of. Yeah. And um, yeah, just navigating all of those mm-hmm. things throughout parenthood. So, yeah. Well, I remember, I mean, I feel like two, like in our generation, you know, we didn't grow. I like really feel like an old person as I say these things. <laughs> in um, my generation, yeah. <laughs> growing up. <laughs> but, but legit, I mean, I feel like we didn't grow up with even the knowledge, right, that people could identify outside of male, female, like that, that people would identify as they, right? I mean, Growing up, I think maybe in high school was when it was like, oh, yeah, like people can be trans and, you know, but still not really understanding what that was. Like that was still highly stigmatized and um, just not really understood. And so I think like we are in an interesting generation where like we didn't grow up with these things. Now we know them. And so now how do we go about these, you know, experiences in our lives that we always might have envisioned looking one way, but now having this new knowledge. And I remember when you had your, you know, kind of gender reveal party, we like had a conversation about that. So I feel like, you knew you were like, Taylor's going to have some shit to say about this. Uh, no, I, it's not just you. I mean, I'm so thankful for where I live and the people I surround myself with. Mm-hmm. And um, I have a cousin who very recently um, has announced that he is he is going by he male mm-hmm. pronouns, but previously was going by them, they. Um, and yeah, and so just knowing I have people in my life um, who I want to respect and yeah. also I just want to have the fun like themed parties too. You know, I put bows on her head and, but like I started trying to call it a sex reveal party mm-hmm. rather than a gender yeah. reveal party. And, yeah, because it's like, this is what their genitals are. They are of female assigned at birth, vagina. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, that's what we think. I don't, she could have been born with a variety of things, but yeah. <laughs> that's what we could tell from the ultrasound at that point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I will say having that reveal party and just like seeing pink balloons come out of the box was really big and like really emotional. And it definitely, I think made things a bit more real for us and set in because I think we could envision a human and not just Mm -hmm. like cells anymore, you know, at that point, no matter what um, she's going to grow up to tell me she feels like, or is, you know, Mm -hmm. um, just at that point, I could envision a type of person or a person in general Mm -hmm. um, to get excited about and look forward to. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. With the openness that that might change and that she might not be the things that you envisioned her to be. Absolutely. And, and Justin and I have talked a lot about that when it comes to having another child, because I've shared with you that at this point, uh, I, would be totally fine not ever having another one um, after that experience. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, it's just a big experience. And so yeah. you know, having a child is a huge responsibility, one or five or whatever. So for me, I'd be okay with one. For him, he definitely still has the idea that he would love to have this um, stereotypical father-son relationship where he gets to do the very traditional father-son activities. And um, so when we talk about having another child, potentially, it's the idea of like, oh, well, should we try for a son? Should we try for a boy? And one, if we get pregnant, I certainly might just be having another female again. Um, so it might not happen at all. You can't control that. And two, what if we do have someone who presents like physically as a male um, and then doesn't, you know, decide that is who they are later on. Mm-hmm. So it's really, yeah, kind of like what you said, like grew, it's, a, it's an idea that we grew up with and thinking yeah. in our mind and just coming to realize that, that's just not how it actually mm-hmm. is these days. People are being more open about it and talking about it and educating others. And so mm-hmm. it changes things. Yeah. Well, and I wonder too, you know, and this is like to no way, like, yes, because Justin is the example here, but I think so frequently there are even like for women of like really wanting a girl and, and wanting, you know, the first thought that comes to my head is like, oh, well, like that's like for you. That's like not for the child. But then it's like, well, a lot of the times having a child is for you sometimes too. Um, But then my thought also goes to like, I think so often when people are having children and, and that being same gendered, it's like an attempt to maybe heal some kind of a trauma that they had with that parent of same sex or having those experiences kind of in the opposite role that they didn't have, right. Being able to give that to someone else. Um, and it's, it's such an interesting like dynamic to think about. Like it's in a way having this like mini me trying to heal trauma in the next generation. Um, I don't know. Even when we were talking about this the other day of like, you know, you're like, I don't see her as like my mini me, you know, like she's her own individual person. I'm like, yeah, like that's like, in my perspective, really healthy to have, because when you do project this person out to be this like mini me version of you, it kind of puts them in a box of like who they're supposed to be and how they're supposed to be. And like having a child isn't to have another you, like it's a, totally new human that has parts of you, but isn't you. And I think people probably feel upset even hearing me say that. (laughs) Well, it's a huge responsibility if you look at it that way. Yeah. Um, Because if it's just like another version of you or a part of you, then, then it's just, I mean, you kind of like own them is Mm -hmm. how I would think that kind of comes across or from just what I'm thinking about is I would feel like I owned her. And instead, I feel like she is her own person. I'm responsible for her. And it is like now my job to make sure she has the best life that I can possibly provide, the best education that I can provide, you know, people that I want in her life to surround her and teach her things and Mm -hmm. just so that she can contribute um, to society and the world and the people around her as she goes throughout her life. So, um, Mm. yeah, it's just very different way to look at it. And, um, Mm. while she's young and has no control, I'll, you know, put all the bows and take her wherever I want. And (laughs) she won't have a say in that. Um, and as she gets older and starts like vocalizing or expressing her opinions (laughs) on things, you know, that'll be a whole nother challenge to like make sure that I'm listening to her and make sure that I'm seeing her and respecting her. And um, so that's, you know, mm-hmm. like personal parenting goals yeah. um, that aren't, aren't easy. So mm-hmm. yeah. just do the best that I can. <laughs> yeah. I don't think any of it is easy. <laughs> no, definitely not. Definitely not. Yeah. And like you said, um, it, my, my cousin who I mentioned, um, actually they, he was born a female. And for my aunt, that was something she's like, always wanted a little girl, yeah. um, gave him a very female name, dressed him in all the pink, all these things. And, um, my aunt is extremely supportive of his entire mm-hmm. journey throughout 
gender identification. And um, so I think that he's very lucky for that. And, um, and yeah, so that's been a great example too, to kind of watch and see and be a part of in a way. Yeah, definitely. And you feel like you are one and done on this. You feel like your vagina and vulva bounced back. You feel like you're ready to just have all the best sex of your life and you got this one and you good. I would be totally okay with that. Yeah, I would be totally good with that. I'm not trying to have my bladder fall out when I'm like running or, you know, so I just don't know. Can my body do it again? I certainly don't want it to. It wasn't the fun experience I mentioned at the very beginning. Like I always looked forward to pregnancy and to birth and all these things. And it is so hard, at least my experience, which really was one of the easier, healthier, Mm -hmm. straightforward pregnancy and birth and postpartum, it still totally sucked. It still was so not Mm -hmm. fun. Um, It is uncomfortable and scary and um, traumatic in different ways. And postpartum, you think like, I just have to get through the birth. Um, No, once you get through the birth, then you're like, you're bottom half of you is healing. I personally didn't tear, uh, thank goodness. So I didn't need stitches or anything. Some women have like third and fourth degree tears all the way through to their butthole and are stitched up or C-sections, you know, where you've had major surgery. And so the whole bottom half of your body is recovering, Mm -hmm. um, just like a post-operative situation uh, for weeks. And then you also have to take care of a new human being who's completely helpless and can't take care of themselves. And if Mm -hmm. you're breastfeeding, there's all sorts of other challenges. My nipples started bleeding. So it's like my boobs are hurting. Everything's bleeding. Everything hurts. Um, And you're completely exhausted. So like you can't rest Mm -hmm. And, you know, so there's, it's just a long, hard process. And even though very much like in a lot of trauma, you don't remember specifics, you know, like the Mm -hmm. actual feeling itself is gone and forgotten. Um, But I remember what I, what I said, you know, what I said to myself, I don't want to do this again. Why did I do this? You know, I remember those very strong personal Mm -hmm. feelings around it. And so that's what I can go back to. I would need a very good reason to have a second child. Mm -hmm. Um, And I would make that decision with my partner, of course, too. Mm -hmm. So if he had a very good reason in which he wanted us to have another one, um, it would be an open discussion. It's not totally closed. Um, But I don't want to just have another one for the sake of having more kids, you Mm -hmm. know. So Yeah. Yeah. And that's very different than what I used to think and feel I would be like. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm wondering if you're open to kind of like talking at all about what the experience of birth was like for you and your processing afterwards. Cause I know, oh, yeah. you know, there's a lot of kind of unpacking of, of what you thought your birth would feel and, and be like and what it was. Um, and I asked this too, because I think like the ways that, that you kind of shared with me about it is so common, I think is so relatable. And I think is like very real that people experience. Yeah. I have some killer photos too. (laughs) You do. You do. You do. You really do. But they were, I definitely thought that they would be more, you were like, are you sure you want to see like their graphic? And I was like, yeah, duh, of course. But (laughs) they were, I, I don't know. I was just expecting, I think like like straight vagina shot yeah I was like I'm ready for it let's see (laughs) yeah if I had given birth in that position I would that would have been incredible I you know um due to how I gave birth like standing squatting position um those were like the best angles that she could get I'm so happy that you can see her head coming out gradually and then the whole body falling out and um but yeah I wasn't ready to go on a bed so you couldn't get that straight you know crowning angle shot but Mm -hmm. um but I love I would love to share my birth story and um yeah. yeah, and all of I know that. And we t- we're going to talk about sex, but go for it. I know. If you want, you can break it up into two different <laughs> things. Whatever. So, um, okay. yeah. 
So I always wanted, like I said, to have a unmedicated birth. Um, I always thought I would do it at my own home. And so I knew that I wanted a midwife and a doula. Um, And a midwife is, you know, similar to a physician. They're the ones who um, help you give birth to your baby, um, who catch it and monitor you and all those things. Um, And the doula is really like a support person. Um, Mm -hmm. I wouldn't compare them to a nurse. It's really like um, someone who is very knowledgeable on the experience of childbirth, who can Mm -hmm. advocate for you, who can support you. Um, And then I specifically chose a doula team who um, also specialized in photography because I knew Mm -hmm. that I wanted to get, I love pictures. So I knew I wanted to get those images. And as I was making the decision on where to give birth, I found a birthing center that was right next to a hospital. Um, So it was very similar to a home birth. You had to, you do not have the option of getting an epidural at the birthing center because there are no physicians there. There is no anesthesiologist there. Um, It's just midwives and doulas. So it's like a birth at home, only I am right across the street from a hospital with a NICU in case of emergencies, whereas my home actually is about 40 minutes away um, from any kind of like high level care. So just that risk factor, having never done it before, I wanted to, you know, be somewhere closer in case of emergency. So I chose the birth center. Um, I was very ready to give birth at 37 weeks. I thought that I was going to give birth early, like apparently every first time mom does, um, because you're just like so ready. And for me, it wasn't that I, you know, pregnancy wasn't that great, as I already said. Um, it wasn't so much that I didn't want to be pregnant anymore as it was giving birth is such a huge event that there's you know, some fear surrounding it. And you want to make sure that you and the baby are going to make it through that event and come out healthy on the other end. So for me, it was very much like I wanted that to be over with. I wanted to have her in my arms, outside of my body, knowing that she was healthy and I was healthy and we could move forward, you know, with the next stage of our lives. And so, um, as the time was coming closer, I knew you're technically considered, you know, full term, totally healthy to have a baby at 37 weeks. That's when I could give birth at the birthing center. So that was my goal was to make it to 37 weeks. And so I did. And then I had my appointment at like 38 weeks. And she said at the next visit, 39 weeks, she could do like a membrane sweep or things like that, which I did not know what that meant. And I Googled it and it said like they stick a finger up your vagina to where your cervix is, and they basically swipe your cervix with their finger, just kind of rubbing it and irritating it to kind of thin it out a little bit and cause friction, irritation, to try and trigger your body into initiating labor. And um, anyway, she said she couldn't, 38 weeks, she didn't want to do it yet. She wanted to wait until the next week, and I thought, fine, whatever. So I set out and I was doing all the things to start labor on my own. We did have sex. <clears throat> I was drinking red raspberry leaf tea. I was going on the walks. I was bouncing on the yoga ball, like all the things that they recommend to try to start labor naturally. I was doing those things. Um, and then uh, I woke up on a Monday morning and there was a little bit of like brown discharge in my underwear first thing. And I thought, oh, this is my bloody show, your mucus plug. And what that is, is uh, the part of your cervix um, at the very opening starts to fall out uh, within a a couple days to a couple weeks before you're going to actually go into labor. It falls out. And that's what that is. And so I thought, okay, labor is close by. I'm going to go into labor within the next 24 to 48 hours texted my mom. I'm like, get ready to come from Spokane. (laughs) I'm having this baby. Um, And Justin and I go on a walk and like all this stuff. And then uh, it still kept coming out the whole rest of the day. I was just having a little bit bleeding all day long, all night long. And the next morning I wake up and there's um, my underwear were wet, Uh, not discharged, but like water kind of, or like clear um, fluid like discharge. And um, 
which to be honest, I've had that before just in my life. Like when I'm ovulating, sometimes I wake up and it's, it would seem like I peed myself. It's just totally clear and wet like water. Um, but because I had had the other things, I was ready to have a baby. I was like, you know, I don't know what this is. I'm going to tell my midwife. And I scheduled an appointment to come in that afternoon at like 4 p.m. So this is Tuesday at 4 p.m. We go into the midwife's office. I show her a picture of my underwear. And she said, you know, that could be your water leaking. I'll have you go to the birthing center and they will test for amniotic fluid to see if it's your water leaking. So we go. They just stuck a Q-tip up there, uh, my vagina, and then they sent it to the lab. About an hour later, it comes back and it's positive. So my water was leaking from somewhere in my belly. So it could have been up really super high. There's also apparently a couple layers to the actual water bag, the holding in your baby. So um, it doesn't mean that my water was broken. It just means it was leaking. Um, and so when it's leaking, because there's an opening somewhere, if water can get out, bacteria can get in. And then your risk of infection goes up, of course. So they said they wanted me to go into active labor on my own within 24 hours of when I noticed it leaking, which would have been like 7 a.m., so this was at like 5 or 6 p.m. on a Tuesday. I had until 7 a.m. to be in active labor on my own. They tell you, you know, you can do these things to try to initiate it, but you also want to get rest. And it's like a balance, right? So all night long, I went back and forth from the hospital because, or the birthing center, because I'm GBS positive, which is group B strep. Um, it's not like the same as like strep throat or something. It's just very common. I think one in three women or something like that, um, have this bacteria in their vaginal canal. Um, and if the baby gets that bacteria as they pass through the canal, it can be life threatening. So they start you on antibiotics during labor because they want to make sure the bacteria is not present when the baby goes through the canal. And so all night long, every four hours for 30 minutes, I have to get this. So all night long, we go back and forth between the house and the birthing center to get this uh, antibiotic of through IV, which I hate. I hated, hated having the IV in my arm. Very uncomfortable. And... Um, and then by 7, 7.30, of course, I'm definitely nowhere close to active labor. So they check me. They do a cervical check to see how dilated I am. This was by far the most traumatic part of giving birth for me personally was a cervical check. I was under the impression that a cervical check was similar to a pap smear where they put uh, the thing in you. I can't, I'm sorry, I don't know what it's called, but the little clamp thing, you know, then they reel it open and open your vagina and they can see in there and put Q-tips or whatever. That is what I was expecting. That was the level of discomfort I was expecting. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that they fisted me. <laughs> the whole ass fist went up there. I am personally not into fisting. My vagina is not big enough to be fisted without any kind of preparation. <laughs> like that was very traumatic uh, and unexpected. It was not explained to me what would happen beforehand. Um, they just, you know, oh, there's going to be some pressure. Here we go. I'm checking. And they just kept going farther and farther inside of me. And I'm like bracing myself. And, you know, like I said, during during sex, during pregnancy, I was crying and emotional. So I just burst into hysterical tears. Um, and that was really traumatic for me. And, you know, she comes out and says, like, I'm not even a half a centimeter. Like, she couldn't even fit one finger through. Like, I'm not dilated at all. Uh, so they send me over to the hospital. The first room that I go in is, uh, like, you're going to be in labor, but you're not actually close to giving birth yet. So it's not a birthing room. It's like a laboring room. Um, so my plan has already been changed. I no longer can give birth at the birthing center. I'm giving birth at a hospital, um, which I wasn't too upset about because it's the same care team. The same midwives were going to be there taking care of me. However, there is a different midwife every seven hours. So every seven hours, I had a different team of midwife and nurses taking care of me. And that meant, you know, at a hospital, they have certain protocols like cervical checks, or they kind of have a timeline of this needs to happen by 
this time. Um, and so just more and more interventions, which of course my original plan was to like have zero interventions. So I had to get a cervical check, um, approximately every seven hours, which really sucked because they were very traumatic. It got to the point where um, they were t- they would tell me, hey, I'm going to have to do a cervical check soon and see where you're at. I would just immediately burst into tears. My whole body was like physically shaking from adrenaline, hysterical crying, just from the thought that they were going to have to do a cervical check soon. So the actual contractions, the actual laboring, uh, were really minimal compared to my anxiety and trauma around the cervical checks. Um, and really, this is because they were doing them when I wasn't dilated. As you start to dilate and your vagina or your vaginal canal opens up, obviously, there's going to be room for a whole human to come out of there. So it's a lot more comfortable for a whole fist or arm to go up in there. But when just an every day, you know, when you're not used to that kind of thing, it's not ready. Um And so it was a long process. I just tried to labor in the bathtub as much as possible because that's comfortable for me. They tried to, um, they did induce me with something called Cetotech, which is a um, uh, artificial form of prostaglandins. So it's a more natural form of induction other than Pitocin, which you hear of a lot. Um, That didn't really work. So then they actually physically broke my water um, by like they shove a little hook up your vagina and like hook through your cervix and pop the bag of water. So water comes gushing out. And then they inserted a Foley bulb, um, which is basically a catheter, like a rubber tube that they they put it in there and they fill it up with water like a water balloon. And then they tie it off and it just sits in there on the inside of your cervix so that it's putting pressure on the cervix to help thin it out and open it up um, from the pressure, which should be from the baby's head. But if they're not low enough or not not heavy enough or whatever, they do that for extra, you know, to move things along. Uh, It was in there all night long and hadn't fallen out. And so the next midwife comes in and says, like, we need this to come out of you. Like, you've been laboring for two days you need to have a baby. So we got to move you along. And she said she would pull it, you know, out for me or I could try. So I'm in the bathtub and I tried to pull it out. Um, It wasn't coming very easily. So I was like, I can't, it's not coming out. It's still stuck in there. Like, And she was like, okay, well, you know, that's okay that you couldn't pull it out, but like, I'm going to need to. And I was like, no, (laughs) let me try again. I'll do it. So I did this time. I like really pulled and there was a bit of pressure, but thankfully it like felt, you know, came out eventually popped out. Um, And that should have put me at four centimeters. You need to be 10 centimeters before you can push your baby out. So uh, at this point, I was in an actual birthing room because after they popped my water and inserted the Foley bulb, my contractions really picked up and were a lot stronger. Um, They keep telling you, you know, that it's going to get worse and that it's going to get more painful. And in my mind, I was like, there's literally no way. (laughs) How could it possibly get more painful than this? I can't imagine it. Um, They're right. It does get more painful. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And um, and. Yeah, so uh, after the Foley bulb came out, I really was at a point where I um, didn't want to be in pain anymore. I had been in active labor for about 16 hours at that point, which like imagine the worst like diarrhea pain of your life (laughs) all over your body for 16 hours straight without a break. I hadn't ate. I hadn't drank anything. I hadn't slept. Like your body is just literally going into shock and trying to Mm -hmm. shut down on you. I was literally like passing out in between contractions. Even if it was just for 30 seconds, my body was like knocked out. Mm -hmm. I'm like in the tub of water. So I would pass out. My mouth would be open. And then I'd like wake up and there's like water in my mouth and I spit out immediately because obviously like I was in it. And so there was blood and fluid and um, it's not a pretty picture. And um, I really was in my mind and I was being so unkind to myself, which is my biggest regret throughout the whole birthing process. Besides any of the interventions or things I wasn't expecting or trauma, the one thing I wish I would change is to be more kind um, and empathetic for myself and just realize that like 
how could I know how I was going to feel in the worst pain of my life if I had never felt that before? Mm -hmm. Of course, you're going to want it to stop. Like when your body is like, get, you know, just shutting down on you to reserve energy and you're in so much pain for so long, if you can have relief, why wouldn't your mind, you know, at least think to yourself like, wow, relief would be great right now, you know? <laughs> Um, but I really beat myself up for wanting that relief because I had gone into it my whole life wanting to do it unmedicated. So the mm -hmm. thought that I might want an epidural, um, I was really hard on myself. I was saying stuff to myself in my mind, of course, um, not out loud because people would have stopped me <laughs> and corrected yeah. me. But in my mind, I was just battling saying, I'm so much weaker than I thought. Oh, I thought I was stronger than this. I'm, I'm not as strong as I thought that I was. I can't believe believe I'm being, you know, such a baby about this and why did I want to do this and just really not kind when if I had said anything out loud or talked to myself or someone, you know, would have talked to me, it would have been the opposite. It would have been like, you're incredible. You are doing this. Like you are having this baby. You're in pain because you're bringing your baby into this world and you're killing it. Like mm -hmm. you have got this. Um, and that's just not how it was. I, no one was talking. My husband was there. I was being very supportive, but it was super emotional and traumatic for him to watch me go through that. Mm -hmm. So he just kind of physically supported me, but we were both totally quiet and I was just trapped in my own brain the whole time. Um, so I did ask for an epidural. And so the anesthesiologist came in and this is the only part of the care team that I was not satisfied with because he really didn't care. Um, to him, I was another body, another poke on with his day. You know, he just was like, are we going to do this or not? Like, if you don't want it, I'll go do another one. I'll come back. Um, and I have a spinal injury. And so I vocalized to him like, well, I'll, here's my concerns. I have this injury. And he was just like, oh, well, that's exactly where we're going to go. And I said, well, can you not? Like, Can you go one above it maybe? And he's like, no, but we'll just go slow. You can tell me if it hurts. And I'm like, it's going to fucking hurt. Like, are you serious? It, everything already hurts. Like this is going to hurt. Um, and I just said, you know, please find this. You can check me again before I make this decision, like a cervical check again. And you already know how much I really hated getting the cervical checks, but like that's how much I didn't want an epidural or didn't like this guy. It's like, fine, do another one. Um, and I was, and it was like 45 minutes after I pulled out the Foley bulb out of four and thank goodness I was a seven. Um, so when I heard I was a seven in that short amount of time, I was like, get out of here. I can do mm -hmm. it. I'll, you know, I can finish this out. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I did, and um, my body started pushing on its own very shortly afterwards, about eight and a half centimeters. Um, and they don't want you to do that because you can cause extra inflammation if you're not ready to push and you start pushing. But I was not, I was not consciously pushing. My body started doing it on its own. Mm -hmm. So they did give me like some Benadryl or something to relieve inflammation um, <laughs> and kind of postpone the pushing a little bit. And then finally she said, um, okay, you're, you're a 10, but your cervical lip, part of your cervix is still covering her head a little bit. So you can keep laboring or I can push the cervix over her head with my fingers while you bear down and push. And I was like, let's do this. We're ready. Get her out. She's coming out. I'll bear down. And she yeah. told me, you know, like everything inside of you is going to want to stand up because I got out of the tub and I walked over to the side of the bed, um, but I did not want to lay down. I did not want to move. I just wanted to stand right there holding on to the bed. Mm -hmm. Justin got on the other side of the bed. So actually I ended up like holding his arms for support. Um, and I just squatted, like I was standing on the floor and I just squatted down into the biggest squat I could do and um, bared down and popped, you know, she popped the cervix over her head. It actually felt great. Like it felt like a relief of pressure. Mm -hmm. um, and I really actually only pushed four times um, for a total of like 12 minutes, which was really, really fast. Like no one was expecting mm -hmm. that. I think they say the average first time, uh, 
birthing person um, is like two and a half hours of pushing. Mm. So for me to have such a long labor and then have a super short like pushing, um, mm. they, no one was quite expecting that. Um, but she was ready and I was ready. And at one point, actually, when she was crowning, they were going to try to help prevent me from tearing. And they said, you know, okay, stop pushing. We're going to get a warm compress, all these things. And I felt I could feel her head was like continuing to slide out. And so I was like, she, she, I'm not pushing and she's falling out. Like Someone <laughs> grab her. So they turned around and, you know, and just swooped her between my legs up into my arms. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. It was like, oh my gosh, so glad and then actually the first thing I said was like, okay, like, are you going to pull the placenta out? Like, what do I have to yeah, do you're next? Like, what now? <laughs> what next? Like, it's like, I can't ever, you know, relax yet. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it was so good to like, to be done. And like I said, the postpartum experience was also not exactly what you expect because you're mm-hmm. not done, you know, for like weeks, um, mm-hmm. but at least the active active labor was over. Um, Mm -hmm. And then you actually continue to have contractions for like, you know, up to 24 hours, or I think maybe even a little longer um, because your uterus is contracting and going back into place. Mm -hmm. So um, you continue to have the same contractions that you were having during labor, just much farther apart and and much less intense. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's probably something else that people don't quite expect is, is that. So, yeah. And then I was like, load me up, give me the ibuprofen, give me the Tylenol. What do you have? I I didn't want to have meds during birth, but now I'm good. Give them all. I'm ready to not feel anything. <laughs> like, please. Um, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. And it's been a lot. It's been a lot of processing. Um, you know that I've been in therapy uh, mm-hmm. once a week. I have like a standing appointment, which I think is super important for like postpartum uh, mm-hmm. mental health and just processing that whole birthing experience as well as all the new challenges that you experience um yeah you know post-birth so therapy is huge having friends like you is huge yeah yeah so yeah I mean it's it's wild because you know you're you're giving birth and that's like that moment but like you said it's kind of weeks afterwards you know even as you're like breastfeeding like you're still in a way giving birth like you're giving life still yeah she's exclusively breastfed we have not needed to supplement thankfully um but that's not easy bleeding nipples cracked nipples engorged breasts you know leaking (laughs) everywhere um yeah so it's definitely not easy and there's always a fear too am I making enough for her Mm -hmm. is she getting enough and you really um count the diapers. She, how many wet diapers, how many poopy diapers is she hydrated? And then I really look forward to her doctor's visits where we get to weigh her and I get to see the physical proof of like, Mm -hmm. this might be really hard, but clearly it's working, you know, you know, it's worth it for me. Um, Mm -hmm. but really throughout the whole experience, I just have a huge new appreciation for all people who have given birth, um, all people postpartum, no matter what that might look like for them. Because um, like I said, you know, I was able, I was able to give birth unmedicated vaginally without tearing. I've been able to successfully breastfeed. Um, My baby is healthy. I'm healthy. All of these things are extremely lucky and I'm very thankful for them. And they've also been very challenging. And so any decision that a parent decides to make, like during that experience, I think like they absolutely should do whatever is right for them um, Mm -hmm. because it is so hard. And so if they need a feed their baby any way they need to feed their baby, they should absolutely do that without zero, you know, shame or guilt. And same thing with the birthing experience. Like I just, you know, I think it took me a long time to feel proud in any way of how I gave birth. Um, And I just think like every woman should feel so extremely proud of their body and themselves Mm -hmm. mentally for going through that process, whatever that was for them. Um, It's just so much easier to like have compassion for others versus yourself. So Mm -hmm. that's why I go to therapy. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Even as you say that, it's like, 
yeah, your bodies are doing so much and you should be so proud of it. So who cares what it looks like? Who cares if it's a little bit heavier than it was before? <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> yes. I know. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it is mind blowing, totally mind blowing. And I'm just so happy for you and happy that everything, you know, for the most part has gone smoothly and everybody's healthy and, and safe. And, you know, it's wild. It's like you're you're still you, but you're different now. You're in a totally new stage of your life. And I'm just really thankful that I get to still be a part of it. And even though we're in a pandemic still, and it's like scary and I can't like see you in the ways that, you know, I I want to hopefully soon. Um, We're both fully vaccinated now. I know. Yeah. By this Wednesday, tomorrow, today, tomorrow. Today's Wednesday. Today's Wednesday? Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. Or maybe it was next week. I can't remember. You know, my time is all warped. Today, <laughs> yeah. either today or next Wednesday, I'm like 100% covered. So yes. we can yes. finally get together. So yeah, soon, soon we, we will be able to see each other. Um, and yeah, it's just, I like, I'm so proud for you and you should be so proud. And I mean, I'm just so happy to be in your life during all of this, like, it's just, it's incredible. And, you know, I still think of like, ew, I'm going to cry. Um, you know, it's like, I still think of us like, you know, doing like choreography to like Britney Spears and Christina Aguilera, you know, like in my room, you know, it's just like crazy, you know, that's like your mom now. Yeah. Well, we still can. And, yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. We'll it, have Mia dancing with us, Naya <laughs> dancing with us. So yeah. soon we'll be able to get back together and we'll choreograph. Mm-hmm. We'll keep doing it. Oh, yes, we will. <laughs> yes, we will. <laughs> Dance till we die. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, well, thank you so much for sharing everything, all the things. And thanks for major letting thanks me. to thanks for having me. Yeah. And major thanks to Justin for being supportive and you being able to share, you know, your experience and, and all of this and, and the sex things and, and the relationship things. Um, do you want to share any places where people can find you or follow you or you like want to shut oh, that sure. shit down and be like, Mm-mm, no, I'm it's private. fine. I actually, you know, it's interesting because. I told you I am, you know, well, you know this already, but I mentioned like I'm a big sharer and I'd Mm -hmm. like to share more, um, especially like birthing experience and baby experience. Um, But there's always like insecurities with sharing stuff that's so intimate, as you know, Mm -hmm. um, with like people on social media. But I definitely Mm -hmm. like try when I can. Um, So I think my Instagram is like chasing Casey Louise on Instagram, I believe. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm Casey Thornton, T H O R N T O N. People can't ever spell it correctly. So, yeah. yeah for the longest it. time, I thought it was Thornton, and then you were like Thorn Ton. Thorn Ton. Yeah, okay. Thornton. Very yeah. Uh, Southern Thornton. Thorn. Yep. Yeah. It's so um, strange. Yeah. You've always been Steinbrink. So I'm just like, what? I know. That's- I know. <laughs> Transitions, you know, life, <laughs> life changes. Very. Hey, I did um, want to mention to you, like I started, so I'm now on my like second cycle since giving birth. Um, and I really wanted to use the chorus with Justin, but I started my period. So we didn't get a chance. Um, so still looking forward to trying that one. Um, yes. But yeah. yeah, so didn't get a chance soon. Soon. I look soon. forward to I'm, it. I'm sure you will make it happen soon. I'm sure it'll. That it'll one will use lots of lube. Yes. Yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah. I mean, all the, all the sex things and yeah, similar to Naya, how I'm like, you know, this is your vulva. This is your vagina. Like this is your clitoris. Like all of those things. Like, yep. I'm sure I will. If you don't or Justin, Justin probably won't, you know, I will definitely be there to have those conversations with her and, and teach her things. You know, Naya comes yes. over and she, like sees my big purple wand and she's like, what this? I'm like, it's some massager. <laughs> I was thinking about that when I saw her like playing on your bed. I was like, oh my gosh, I wonder if she like, are her sex toys put away? Are they like hidden under pillows? Is she going to find it? And yeah, um, yeah goes, what those conversations are like. Yeah. She goes underneath my bed and that's where I like some of the ones that are just like, I just like keep like super handy that I use like most frequently I put there, which is usually where the wand is. And yeah, she goes under the bed to try to find Lily and then she finds it and then she pulls it out. And what 
this I magic just, wand that yeah. you don't insert all the way into your vagina. You do <laughs> not. You do not. I was like, whoa. I was like being fisted all over again. <laughs> Yeah, which is fine if you like that, you know, more power to you. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is possible and and can be enjoyable. Um, But yeah, the because she she'll see it on my stories sometimes, like when Rob like goes through my stories, you know, like she'll see it and he's just explained it to her as like, those are adult ticklers. (laughs) (laughs) She's like, she'll be like, it's a tickler. And I'm like, yeah. It is. It's a massager. Just but with tickle. the wand, it literally is like an all body, like you, you can use it on your shoulders and stuff. So with that, I'm like, yeah, like you can massage your shoulders or your leg or, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, I desexualize it, you know, and I'm just like, yeah, it's just a body massager and tickler and, um, oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure we have a Belessa ad on this episode. So, yeah, you can check out the We Vibe Wand on Belessa as well in wherever the ad is placed in this episode. Okay. <laughs> but it will also be in the uh, episode notes and same with Casey's Instagram. Um, so everyone can check that out there. Thank you so much, Casey, for everything. Thank for you. I love you. I love you too. All right, that does it for today's episode. Thank you so much for making it all the way through and keeping your ears, your hearts, and your minds open. It would mean so much to me if you could take a second or two after listening to this episode to leave a review on iTunes and let me know what you're enjoying about the show. I love reading you know, what your favorite episodes are, where you guys listen, um, and definitely feel free to share this with a friend. I mean, part of how we break down the stigmas around these topics is by talking about them, right? And, and sharing them with more people. So definitely share the podcast Um, and again, really wanting to include all of you in this podcast. So if you have questions or you want to share a thought or an experience, please send in a voice memo to ask.letstalkaboutit at gmail.com. And I'm really excited to keep having these conversations and uh, breaking down these stigmas. So thank you all so, so, so much. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week and I'll talk to you next time. 